Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, Good morning, I brought my Bible. Um, I'm confused as to why nobody's sitting in the very front row. Well, Dom, you are, you guys are, but it, then it's empty. I don't know, these are the things that weigh on me at night. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't spit, do I? Okay, I just wanna make sure that I'm okay with that. Would you turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter two. So a little boy built uh, a boat. Thank you for that boat. He built a boat. He was so proud of all the work he did to put sails on it and to get it uh, worthy to put on the water. And as soon as he was done building the boat, he held it up and he said, it's mine. I made it. So then he took it to the lake, uh, Cochity Lake, no, he took it to a, to a little more sizable lake than that, and he um, set it on a very placid water, beautiful blue water. It was a nice day. A gentle breeze was blowing. He tethered it to a piece of string so it could get carried out by the breeze, and he watched it as he guided it along the shore, and he was so pleased, so happy. This was his boat. He made it. But then something happened. A gust of wind came up, broke the string, and it carried that little boat out further and further onto the lake, and it eventually vanished. He lost his little boat. It was lost. He went home sad. A few weeks later, he's walking downtown by the toy store, and he goes right past the window, and something catches his attention. He turns and he goes, could it be? Is it possible? And it was indeed his boat. He could tell by the details on it. So he walks inside the shop. He points to the boat and says to the store owner, excuse me, sir, that's my boat. I made it, it's mine. The store owner said, son, congratulations, you did a good job, but it's mine now, and if you want it, you have to pay that much for it. Well, again, the boy walked out sad because he made it, but he was determined. He went home, he worked hard, he saved up his allowance money for the next several weeks, and by the end of the summer, he made enough money to go back and buy the boat, and he did. He walks into the store, lays out the cash on the counter, purchases the boat, takes the boat, and says, now you're twice mine. You're mine because I made you, and you're mine because I bought you. That is a picture of redemption. We belong to God because he made us, and we belong to him because he purchased us, he bought us. Paul has already stated the first part of that truth in chapter 1, verse 16, that Jesus Christ created everything in heaven, on earth, whether visible or invisible, so we are his because he made us, but now he tells us that we are his because he bought us, he purchased us. And that really takes us to the paragraph that we're stuttering, st stuttering, studying, um, I'm stuttering, but we are studying <coughs> Colossians chapter two in verse 11, where Paul says, in him, that is in Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Let me tell you just a little bit about what we just read. Uh, Paul the Apostle is like the king of metaphors. Um, he, he likes figurative language. He likes analogies. And in this paragraph, he like stacks them up. I think it was my, one of my English teachers who said, never mix your metaphors. Uh, Paul mixes them a lot. And here he talks about the cross, one event in history, the cross of Jesus Christ, and our redemption, and he speaks of it in five different ways, five different metaphors, circumcision, baptism, resurrection, a financial transaction, and a military victory. It's like he realizes my audience may be in the military, might be bankers, might be Jewish people, might be this, might be that. I'm going to come up with descriptions of the same thing, but in different ways. So he stacks up these metaphors. And here's why. As believers, we have a single reference point that we are always told to go back to and remember, and it's the cross. It's like our reset button. That's why the New Testament, that's why Jesus at the Last Supper said, I want you to do this often in remembrance of me. I don't want you to ever let this fact go that I am going to the cross, and I want you to take these elements often, and when you do, do it in remembrance of me. We're always going back to the cross. It is the major theme of all four Gospels. It's estimated that depending on which of the four Gospels you are reading, between 20% and 40% deal with that one event, the cross of Christ. Also, Jesus is called in Revelation 13, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So what that means is all of the Old Testament points forward to the cross. All of the, Old, all of the New Testament looks back to that event, and we are told to completely and ongoingly remember that. Now, the name of this message is uh, after a hymn. I named this message, Jesus Paid It All, and I did it intentionally. We, we sang a little bit of that hymn a moment ago. That was a song that was written 175 years ago um, by a 47-year-old widow who was sitting in a choir loft one Sunday morning, and after a message, I don't know what the message was on, I'm sort of guessing it might have been Colossians as I read the lyrics of the song, uh, she's listening to the message, and at the end of the message, the pastor gave a rather lengthy pastoral prayer, during which time she opened up her hymnal and got a blank page, and she wrote a little poem that became this wonderful hymn that we just sang. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. But there's a fourth verse that is often not sung because hymns, as you know, are lengthy uh, endeavors. And the fourth verse is probably my favorite. And we'll put this up on the screen because it feeds right into what we have been studying in Colossians. And now complete in him, and now complete in him, my robe, his righteousness, close sheltered neath his side, I am divinely blessed. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. 
She is writing about the total sufficiency of Christ. And she says, and now complete in him. May I remind you of verse 10 from last week's study? Look at verse 10 of Colossians 2. And you are complete in him. That's his statement. He has made you full, complete. Okay, now in verse 11 down to verse 15, the passage that we are considering this morning, he tells us how we are made complete. He gives us three separate areas of completion. The areas are cleansing, canceling, and crushing. Cleansing, canceling, and crushing. He cleansed my past. He canceled my debt. He crushed my foes. So let's consider the first. He cleansed my past. That's in view in verse 11. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, in this paragraph, he mentions two rituals, right? Circumcision and what's the other one? Anybody remember what we just read? You, you can talk in church. So circumcision's one. What's the other ritual? Baptism. Baptism. Circumcision and baptism. Both of those were Jewish rituals. A lot of people think, no, no, baptism sort of came along when Christians came along. Jews practiced it first. It became initiated into the Christian church and became something we continue to practice as commanded by Christ. But circumcision and baptism are mentioned. Why? Why circumcision? Well, we've been telling you the last several weeks about what we are calling the Colossian heresy. It became known as Gnosticism later on. It was this belief system that started spreading through the congregation, and it was a mix. Um, it was an amalgamation. It was a syncretism of a few different belief systems from pagan philosophy to Jewish legalism, you know, sort of like a smorgasbord of religious ideas, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and throw it all together. They would have loved the bumper sticker that I see on cars, the coexist bumper sticker. They'd have been all over that. It's like, yeah, a little bit of everything. It's all the same. And uh, that became their heresy that they were pushing. But part of that is they insisted that if you're a male, like in Judaism, you must be circumcised. If you want to be right with God, you have to go through the ritual of circumcision. I probably don't have to explain what circumcision is uh, to any of you, uh, but I will just tell you that uh, on the eighth day of a male baby's life, the foreskin of the child was excised, it was cut off, and it was a sign, an outward ceremony of an inward spiritual reality it symbolized the cutting away of the flesh life. It symbolized that I have a covenant with God that I follow God. Great. Here's the problem with circumcision. It's also the problem with baptism, by the way. Is people started looking at the ceremony as a magic charm. As long as I go through the ceremony, I'm okay. As long as I get circumcised, I'm all right. Like, like people say, when you ask them, are you saved? And they don't answer the question. You know what they say? I've been baptized. Wasn't my question. Didn't ask you if you once got wet. I'm asking you, are you a saved individual? Well, I got baptized. So they were doing that. They were looking back to the ritual, and they were trusting the ritual as something that would save them. And uh, that goes all the way back early on in the early church. In Acts chapter 15, there was a group of people we call them the Judaizers, who came into the church and said, unless you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they really held to that ritual. It got so bad that the rabbis even had a few sayings about circumcision. One of them was, circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna. And the other one is that, circumcision will deliver Israel from Gehenna. So what they're saying is whether you take it personally or nationally, what saves a person from hell is the ritual of circumcision. So you'll notice that Paul is referencing 
this ritual. But look at verse 11. Paul does not say, okay, you guys, you need to be circumcised. He says, in him you were also circumcised, Jew or Gentile, male or female. In him you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So obviously he is speaking spiritually. He's using a metaphor. By the way, even Moses himself knew that the ritual only pointed to a reality. Moses in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10 said to the children of Israel, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Yeah, you can have gone through the ritual of circumcision, but you can have a stiff neck or a hard heart. You cannot be right with God even though you went through the ritual. Okay, so he mentions that, and this is the metaphor, that spiritually speaking, he has done for you at the cross um, a cleansing at the deepest level. He cleansed you of your past, and that is symbolized by circumcision and baptism. But I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture that's going to shed a little bit of light on this. Go back just a couple pages into the book of Philippians, the book right before this one. Go to Philippians chapter 3, because I'm going to have you and I read something that I think is going to surprise you a little bit. He's talking about circumcision again. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. We know this letter is the happy letter, right? Philippians is the letter of joy. Paul's in jail, but he's filled with joy. Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Now, now watch this. Beware of dogs. Whoa, what, what's up with that? It's like, hey, dudes, rejoice in the Lord. Beware of dogs. Whoa, what a, what a switch. Now, he's not saying beware of Fido. Beware of the pit bull in your neighborhood, like the people have those signs, because back then, dogs, dogs were not pets. People didn't have dogs that they brought into the house. Dogs were scavengers. They hunted in packs. They carried diseases. And um, there's something else you need to know. Ancient Jewish people often referred to non-Jews, Gentiles, as Gentile dogs. Paul picks up on the term, but he calls not Gentiles dogs, but people who are pushing circumcision as dogs. So he says, beware of dogs. Watch this. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. He's referring to circumcision. He calls it here a mutilation. Now, I know he's talking about circumcision because, look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So who's he talking about when he talks about dogs? He's talking about men whose teaching distorts the gospel. Men whose teaching distorts the gospel. Those people who add anything to the gospel of grace are dogs. Wow. You know that salvation is a free gift, right? Um, Ephesians 2, by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the, tell me, gift of God. But some people add to that. They add religious duty to that. You got to go to church. You got to keep the rules. You got to do this. You got to take a pilgrimage. Paul would say, dogs or they add moral responsibility. Uh, you can't be saved until you stop smoking. You can't be saved until you stop drinking. You can't be saved if you listen to that kind of music. True or false? False. So what does Paul say about them? They are? No, say it like I say it. They are? Dogs. Yeah, scavengers. These are people who are ripping off your faith. And then, I love how he puts this in Philippians 3, verse 3, for we are the circumcision, the true circumcision, who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. 
That is, we depend totally on Jesus Christ. The humanist will say, no, you got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And the legalist will say, you got to work your way to heaven and keep the rituals and go through the ceremonies. But Christians will say, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's all credit to him. But the moment you start adding to the gospel, it's dangerous. Because, Paul would say, he and he alone cleansed your past. Back in 1922, they made a very interesting and significant discovery in Egypt when they uncovered the tomb of King, King Tut, right? Most of us, that's all the Egyptology we know, King Tut. So King Tut, 1922, they uncovered his um, tomb. They went inside and they found not just the burial chamber and the ornate decorations of the burial chamber, they found his sarcophagus or the burial box, large casket, a very ornate casket. They opened up that casket and they found inside that casket another casket of gold leaf over wood. They opened up that casket and they found, guess what? Another casket of solid gold. They opened up that casket, they did not find another casket, but they found a gold mask and gold cloth and gold stuff, and they took that off, and you know what they found? A dead guy. <laughs> a, a withered up, even though he was a boy king, old looking corpse. Now that is what religion and ritual and legalism especially does. All they're doing is dressing up a corpse. There's gold, looks pretty good, yeah, but it's dead. He's dead. You can dress the thing up, but the problem is there is separation of life. Speaking of that, look at verse 13. He kind of presses that point. And you being what? Dead. And you being dead, well, that's a problem. If you're dead, that's a problem. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. So here he says, big problem is, and the reason you need the cross is we were in the realm of death. We were spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2 is almost identical to this. He says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Interesting that he said you were dead, but you walked. You were indeed the walking dead, Paul was saying in Ephesians chapter 2. It's important that we, um, we, we get this. Unbelievers aren't just sick, they're dead. They are dead. They don't need a self-help course. They don't need a personality adjustment. They need salvation. And you've heard me say this a number of times through the years. You, you can put a person in school and you'll get an educated sinner. You can put a person in therapy and you'll get a well-adjusted sinner. You can stick a person in church and you'll get a religious sinner. You have to take a person to the cross to get a saved sinner. And that's, that's what Jesus did. That's what he is all about. So um, the thing about being dead is you can't improve your condition. And you can't feel or hear anything. It would be really lame, wouldn't it be, to, for me to talk to a corpse and say, hey, did you really like that sunset last night? Wasn't that awesome? Because, first of all, he's dead, so he had no ability to appreciate the sunset last evening. Second, he can't hear what I'm saying. Third, he can't respond. So the only hope for a dead person is a resurrection. And so you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And this is where the good part comes. This is where the Easter part comes. It says, he, verse 13, has made alive together with him. He made us alive. By the way, this is the purpose of baptism. Some of you are going to get baptized 
after the service. We can't wait for that. The purpose of baptism is not to make you alive. It's to show that you've already been made alive. It's simply a portrayal. We like to say an outward sign of an inward change. Uh, we like to tell people when they're getting baptized, welcome to your funeral. Uh, we're going to take you, stand you up in the water, and this is all symbolic. And then we're going to put you down. We're going to have you hold your nose, put you down backwards. And that's a symbol of you died and we're burying you now and we'll keep you under the water. <laughs> a second, bring you right back up <laughs> as a symbol that you've been raised to newness of life. And Paul said in that metaphor of Romans where he talks about that, even so we should walk in newness of life to portray that. So that circumcision and baptism, he cleansed my past. Second reality, he canceled my debt. Go back to verse 13, because he says, he made us alive together with him. Um, okay, good, that's good, Paul. He made us alive. How did he do that? How did he make us alive? What's the next phrase? Having forgiven you all your trespasses. That's how he did it, forgiveness. When Jesus was stapled on a Roman cross, in his suffering, he made seven statements on that cross. And the first words out of his mouth, remember what they were? First words. Father, forgive them. Why was that the first thing out of his mouth? I think it's because forgiveness is man's greatest need and forgiveness is God's greatest accomplishment. So, Father, forgive them. Now I can pray that prayer. Now it's possible for people to be forgiven because of what I am doing. I read an article this week that got my attention. Listen to the title of this article. The title is, Two-Thirds of Americans Know They're Sinners. That's a, that's a great, that grabbed my attention. I wanted to read that article. So I started reading the article because I've always had a, a, a hunch that people who aren't saved know they're sinners. I know they try to humanize it and philosophize it and get cute about it, but deep inside, they know they live in, in a deficit. They know that. And um, the article says as much, two-thirds of Americans know they're sinners. According to one research group, 67% of Americans say they are sinners, and most people aren't too happy about it. Uh, it goes on to say, as America becomes more secular, the idea of sin still rings true. Okay, so now what? Now that I figured out I'm a sinner, now what? Now get forgiven for it, right? Come now, let us reason together, Isaiah 118. Though your sins are as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though, though they be red like crimson, I'll make them like wool. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed means happy. A happy man is a forgiven man. Blessed is the man, happy is the man, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So, so how does he forgive us? Well, what does it say right after that? Having forgiven you all trespasses, now, now he paints a picture of forgiveness. Now he, he chooses a different metaphor, a different analogy. Here it is, verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, you see that phrase, handwriting of requirements? Some of your Bibles say certificate of debt. Literally, the phrase is something written by your own hand. It referred to an autograph um, or a... A written certificate of debt, handwritten by the debtor himself, acknowledging that he owes you. We would look at that as an IOU, an admission of debt, an admission of guilt. So Paul is saying, uh, you folks had an IOU in hand. You admitted, like the survey says, that you're sinners. Uh, you admitted your failure. You announced your guilt. Jesus came along and wiped it out. 
literally wiped it off. Wiped it off. If you have an old King James Bible, it's actually the best translation of this verse, blotting out the handwriting. Picture somebody with a sponge or a, a, a cloth blotting something out. That is really the meaning of it. Now, let, let me explain the analogy, the word picture, the metaphor. In ancient times, before they had a printing press and before they had paper, they would write documents on two different types of material. One was called papyrus, made out of bulrushes that grew by rivers. Another was called vellum, V-E-L-L-U-M. It was thin hide of an animal. It became a writing surface. But the inks in antiquity, the ancient ink, did not have an acid content to it. So it wouldn't penetrate the material. It basically just sort of sat on top, on the surface. And so sometimes you could write a whole document, but if you wanted to use that vellum again or papyrus, you just wipe it off, right? Like a whiteboard and a magic marker and start again. So I think that'd be kind of cool. I'd like, to, I'd like to get a ticket like that. If I got a ticket by a police officer and said, you're guilty, man, you owe like 100 bucks. Thank you very much. And I just wipe it off. I'm good to go. So he took the handwriting of requirements and he blotted it out or he wiped it off. And it says nailed it. The handwriting of requirements, verse 14, he's taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross. How many of you know that in ancient times when they crucified people, the Romans insisted that the crimes of that victim be posted above that victim? So everybody could see what he's guilty of. That's why when Jesus died, they couldn't pin anything on him. All they could write is, this is Jesus of Nazareth. He's the king of the Jews. But typically they would say insurrection, murder, thievery. They'd, they'd list all the crimes as if to say, this is what happens if you cross the Roman government. So... Let me throw up on the screen a translation called the J.B. Phillips translation. He was a great translator from England a while ago. This verse, he translates it this way. Christ has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments, which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it by nailing it over his own head on the cross. That captures the truth. The guilt that hung over your head because you knew you, you weren't worthy. You knew you'd blown it. He's wiped it away by nailing it to his own cross, putting it over his own head. Great story, true story. I hear, I've read about it. Martin Luther said he had a dream one night where Satan appeared to him, and Satan came with like a long list, several pages, scrolls of Luther's life, a record of Luther's sins, written in Martin Luther's own handwriting. So it fits this perfectly. And in the dream, there's Satan kind of like, I don't know if he had reading glasses or what, but he's looking at all the sins of Martin Luther, and, and there's Luther on the other side. And in the dream, Satan says, is this all true? Did you write this? And Luther's going, yeah, that's me. I did it. And scroll after scroll, page after page, reads the list of his sins and says the same thing. Is this true? Did you write this? And it just by the end of this, he's feeling so low and so humiliated because it's all true. And Satan is ready to leave. Having totally humiliated Martin Luther, Satan's ready to leave the scene. And Martin Luther says, wait, hold on. It's true, every word of it. But now write this across the top of all that. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses a man from all sin. It's true, but so is that. So is that. There is no tyrant worse than guilt. When you know that you failed and you live with that failure and you carry around that guilt, and having that guilt removed is, is the most liberating and wonderful feeling. And I've told you before that my own salvation experience I was 18 years old. I was in San Jose, California. I'm watching Billy Graham on television. I prayed the prayer. I received Christ. I didn't hear a voice, never saw lights, but I felt something. And what I felt was lighter. It's like I was defying gravity. It's like I feel buoyant. 
I feel like a burden has been lifted. I, I guess I felt like what Isaac Watts wrote in that great hymn of his when he said, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. The joy that accompanies that kind of guilt lifting is phenomenal. I experienced that. So he cleansed my past. He canceled my debt. And let's close where he closes this paragraph. Verse 15, he crushed my foes. He crushed my foes. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers. And you see that phrase, principalities and powers? You know what he's talking about? It's a phrase used six times in the New Testament. Every time he uses the phrase principalities and powers, he's referring to angelic beings, principally demons, malevolent angelic beings, the ones who hassle you and tempt you. Principalities and powers, having disarmed principalities and powers, he, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them. He's still referring to the cross that he's been talking about in verse 14 making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Okay, now he changes metaphors yet again, and he's speaking of a military victory. Here's what he is, has in his mind. When he writes this, everybody understood this, but you and I don't. 2,000 years ago in Rome, when Roman generals conquered an army, conquered an enemy, there was always a triumphus, they called it, a Roman triumph that took place in Rome for that general. And there's plenty of historical records we have of that. For example, the historian Plutarch uh, writes that when General Aemilius Paulus, the Roman general, defeated the Macedonian army, that they had a three-day, three-day triumph procession in Rome. So day one, they brought out 259 chariots of the enemy filled with statues and riches and pictures parading it through the streets of Rome to the applause of the crowds. On day two, they had wagons that were filled with the armor of the slain Macedonian soldiers who died. On day three, the captives were paraded through Rome, the POWs of the Macedonian army. Um, also, the captured chariot of the Macedonian king was put on parade, also the crown of the king and the armor of the king. And at the end of the parade on day three, the victorious general, Aemilius Paulus himself, it was sort of the icing on the cake, he would march through the streets. All of that was a Roman triumph, a public spectacle. So Paul is using that metaphor and that also happened at the cross. Let me give it my translation. When Jesus died on the cross, he took a victory lap. He took a victory lap. He said on the cross, another statement, it is finished. I would state it a little bit differently. I don't want to add to the scripture, but it's like he said to Satan, checkmate. Checkmate. Now I can forgive people. Now, for generations, people who have been in your clutch and subject to your lies can now be made free. It is finished. Completed transaction. Checkmate. He did that on the cross. It was a triumph. It was a public spectacle. I think you know, if you don't, you need to know that every demon in hell wanted to stop the cross from happening. They had a hunch that this would be the end of their reign, that the cross could somehow strip them of their power with the redemptive work of Christ. And so throughout the life of Jesus, they tried to stop the cross on a number of occasions. Satan tried to get Jesus killed when he was a baby in Bethlehem by having Herod come up with that insane plan, let's just kill all the babies in town. Um, he escaped. That didn't work. So later on, Satan wanted to get Jesus thrown off a cliff in his own hometown of Nazareth. That didn't work. So Jesus uh, is in the wilderness, and Satan comes to tempt him and offers him a deal. 
says, you know what? If you'll just bow and worship me, I'll give you. I'll give you what you came for. You came for the world. You came for the nations of the world. You came to go to a cross and redeem them. You don't have to go to the cross. I'll give it to you if you'll worship me. There's a little verse. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's tucked into 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where it says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The rulers put Jesus on the cross and were thinking, finally, it's done. Oh no, pal, it's just beginning. You are really playing into God's hands because Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's all part of his plan. So, at the cross, he disarmed principalities and powers, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing or parading, triumphing over them in it. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are going, that sounds good on paper. But if you could see my life, you would know that I am being tempted and hassled by a very powerful and active Satan. So if all of that is true and he has been disarmed, then why do I still get tempted? Why do I still experience spiritual warfare? All of that is true. But here's what I'm saying. You no longer need to fear the outcome. You see, when he took a victory lap, it's because he knew the victory parade is coming. The true parade, uh, Revelation chapter 20 pictures that end time parade. It says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. So, yep, you're still hassled by Satan, by demons. You're tempted, you're tested, you're tormented. But ultimately, they can't be victorious. Ultimately, no matter how you blow it and fail and you feel you don't make it up to speed, Ultimately, simply because you believe in Jesus, he's going to get you to heaven. Nothing's stopping that. That's why Paul writes Romans 8 this way, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present or things to come or height or depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That's a good place for an amen right there. Fun little question on the side. Why does Paul, and it's hard to even answer this, but why do you think Paul feels the need when he talks about the cross to throw in the principalities and power thing, the parade over them? Why does he have to throw that element in? Can he just say, look, we've been baptized, we've been circumcised, we've been resurrected, and there's a financial um, arrangement where he wiped out everything against you? Couldn't he just end there? Why the, oh, and by the way, Principalities and powers have been vanquished. Here's why. Part of the Colossian heresy is that they were worshiping angels. They believed in emanations, good emanations, bad emanations, all angelic beings, all sub-gods that they thought you need to get a grip on and understand and go through and work your way to God. And so he just says, go back where we started, go back to... What we looked at last week, verse 10, says, And you are complete in him who is the head of all what? Principality and power. So Christ is enough. He did it all. Don't worry about demons. Don't worry about angels. He is the head of all principality and power. So then... If it's true that you are complete in him, my question is this. Why are you looking for completion anywhere else? Why are you looking to be fulfilled in anyone or anything else if you really can't be? And I want to say to you, live your life and have relationships, but don't look to any relationship to totally satisfy you because every human relationship will fail. Every human will fail you at some point, disappoint you. 
Um, go ahead and have a career and enjoy the status of that career, but if you are looking to your career for your ultimate fulfillment, you're going to be sorely disappointed. It can't provide that. Go ahead and go to school and get educated, but all of the degrees and smarts and all that stuff won't satisfy you. Live your life, but I'm saying live your life for the one who gave you real life. Because, back to this truth, you're his. You're his because he made you, and now you're his because he bought you. You're his, you belong to him, and he completes you. And, and please don't buy into the stupid, lame, worldly philosophy. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's good to have Jesus. He's sort of a good spoke in your wheel. Good to add a little religion on the side. No, he is everything. He is all in all. That in all things he might have the supremacy. You're his because he made you. You're his because he bought you. And if he didn't yet... Finalize the transaction because you haven't surrendered your life to Christ. If you're lost this morning, if you're dead and you know you're dead, that's so good. You see, a person who's spiritually dead and doesn't know he's spiritual, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I don't need anything. So bad. Hopeless. 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 person goes, yeah, I, I'm part of that two-thirds. I know I'm a sinner. I don't feel good about it. Okay? If you know that, that's such a sign that God is working in your life. Don't let the guilt hang over your head. Jesus would step up and say, let it hang over my head. Let your guilt hang over my head. Let me wipe away anything against you and make you my child. But I won't do it unless you let me do it. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, as Martin Luther said in that dream, quoting scripture, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses a man, a woman, a person from all sin. And the truth of the apostle written in such figurative, metaphoric language that Jesus cleansed my past and canceled my debt. And ultimately crushed my foes. So it's only fitting that we sing songs of victory and we raise our hands and we get excited about Jesus because this isn't religious drivel. This is life. This is life. Father, we pray that if anybody here has not yet experienced life, experienced forgiveness, that they would experience it today. Listen, if you're in the room or you're outside in the amphitheater or you're listening by our radio broadcast or online, if you've never given your life to Christ, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait for a fancy song or uh, an event. Just do it right now, right where you are. I want you to say this to the Lord. Say it directly to him. Just say, Lord, I admit I am a sinner and I am sorry. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he came. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. I turn from my past. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, and you meant that after the service. We're going to close with a song. We're going to get really happy. And there's a lot to be happy about today, a lot to rejoice in. If you just consider what we just read, you should be the happiest people in the city of Albuquerque. So uh, let's all stand. And if you did pray that prayer uh, in your heart, afterwards, would you find one of our team members, our decision team members? Um, they have little badges. And the badge says, we don't need no stinking badges. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't say that. It'll say a uh, connect team or I'm a leader or a pastor of some kind. Find one of us and just say, I prayed that prayer. We want to give you a hug, welcome you into God's family. But let's close in a, in a celebration. 
Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.